that's about our own mortality. Like while we're, if we're fully engaged in life, it's hard to, it's just hard to wrap our brain around it stopping. Yeah. Um, and so if our life involves other people, it's hard to wrap our brain around those people not being there anymore. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the Business of Happiness podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Taryn McCarthy, and today is going to be a great day because we have one of my favorite guests back in the podcast with us again today. Please join me in welcoming Sonia Wires. Welcome, Sonia. Thank you so much, Taryn, for having me again on your podcast. It was ah. so good to be here once. It's even better to be here a second time. <laughs> I'm so excited to have you here. And I love celebrating incredible women, especially when they do amazing things more than once. And so last time we had you on talking about your incredible book, Happiness Now, A Guided Journey. And since then... There we go. Thank you for all you YouTube watchers. She just put up the book for us so we could see it. And the link will be in the show notes because it's an excellent book written by this incredible Gestalt therapist telling us how she has supported her clients and herself in finding that sense of happiness. And now in your second book, which has been published since we last spoke, Sonia, Sundown of Life. Yes. I am so honored to have been one of your supporters of the book <laughs> in reviewing it before it went to publishing. Thank you for that honor. And now to have you on the show to share a little bit about your story, specifically about when you were facing that very difficult situation of being in business, running a private practice, and caring for your parents in the end of their life. So welcome to the show again. And thank you so much for being here to share your insight and your experience. I, um, I'd love for us to just start with, actually, since you've written the book, how has reflecting on this book, you know, you went through these last few years with your parents and then dove into the book, which I'm sure was a form of therapy for you as well. But how have you been since having published the book in terms of your relationship with those years? Well, actually, you know, what's interesting is that, um, so my parents, the difficult years were 2018 and 2019. When mm. 2018, they both declined. My mom had cognitive decline. My dad has some physical decline. Mm. He had several surgeries. Like every time he went to the hospital and he wasn't there, my mother declined some more, which upset him and worried him. And I was there to be with her. She didn't want me. She wanted him. Mm. Anyway, it was all complicated. My mom passed away in December of 2018 and my dad, nine short months later, his cancer that he'd had that was really completely controlled, taken out except for a few cells, the report said, just flared up in the face of his own grief. And so in September of 2019, right, March of 2020, the first lockdowns hit. Right. And the author community I was in, um, at self-publishing school that helped me, um, write my my two books three actually because one of them i wrote also in french but um they had a lockdown challenge can we write a million words all together or something so here i went you know i was going to write up this story i decided to write this story because i had started writing emails to friends and family to let them know what was going on you know first just my parents my my dad's siblings and then a little bit broader but by the end i had 70 people at the end of email lists in french and in english a total of 70 ish people and i had a couple of people say how helpful it had been that i'd written those emails oh. one person said she had made peace with her parents or something had changed anyway i can't remember exactly i could find it but um, something significant had changed for her in relationship to her parents who had been dead 10 years already. Wow. Um, and some other people who knew my parents, but who couldn't come and say goodbye in person said it was so helpful to have all those news and the way I wrote it and whatever. And so it's from that email, all that email correspondence that I wrote the book, obviously I made it into a book. It's not just, you know, emails. Um, but so I started in the spring of 2020, just to get back to your question. Um, but that, that is also when the grief kind of came upon me. 
Mm. And so I was like, okay, I can't write about it and do the grief all at once. That's not going to work. So I put the, you know, I laugh about it now, but it wasn't funny. Um, so I put the book aside. I was like, grief has got to do its thing. Mm. And so that was a good like nine months or something. Um, and so, you know, one day in early 2021, I was like, oh, you know, I feel better kind of <laughs> the way uh, grief goes if you let it, um, if you let it do its thing. And then I actually um, finished writing this book only in, in 2022. So, um, yeah. So it's been fresh since you've published it. Yeah, so it's and been fresh. It, it, it was published in the early summer, uh, in July sometime. Yes. Um, and so it's not that long ago. No, it isn't. <laughs> so it's more the time between the events and actually finishing the book that, that um, um, you know, I had to have a bit of distance. Like I... Mm. You know, I some of the some of the writing, even you know, two three years later, um, you know, got a got a good cry out of me, but it was a good cry without you know the the gut wrenching grief. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was more like on the side of nostalgia um, than on the side of deep deep gut wrenching grief. So, what for you was more challenging? Was it those years when you were really caring for two ailing parents in very different ways and the complexity of the relationships you were referring to in terms of your mother wanting only him around and you really being the only able-bodied capable person to care for her and then his challenge with your mom's cognitive decline um were those years more trying for you or was it subsequently when you were in grieving um hmm, that's hard to compare because they're really two very different animals um so i would say um and that this is why i wrote the book actually that i wanted to you know give ho hope to people um also that in the midst of all the trying situation i also had you know deep satisfaction of first of all being where being in that place that was mine to be in Right. I'm an only child. My parents were, um, you know, four or five hour drive away from me. I think in about six months of doing 10 round trips, um, they, you know, in agreement with my dad, they came to a retirement home near me. Uh, but things continued to unravel, but at least they were, you know, a mile and a half away rather than. Ah. Um, so it just the unraveling was. Uh, still just as exhausting, like, oh, gosh, another is something else now. <laughs> um, but so the, the thing is like being, it, it's probably one of the times in my life that I felt more useful, right? <laughs> That's um, what I was wondering. I was wondering if you found some relief in being able to actually do something, well, even though so that was so exhausting. Yeah. I don't know if relief is the word, but really a sense of meaning or mm. it, something was very meaningful in being able to be there. Mm. And also like the way, I mean, I'd had, I'd had a good relationship with my dad, you know, mostly always, mm. but really the depth of conversation and exchange that we were able to have about, you know, how things were going, what to do, how to think of it, how to see the future. And even my mom actually for who, um, you know, when people comment on my skin that I have beautiful skin, I say I credit my mom. Like she couldn't leave me only emotional wounds, right? Oh, <laughs> I credit my mom with the 15 years of therapy I've been through, um, and also <laughs> for the beautiful skin she left me. But so being with her, like it didn't matter, you know. So mm -hmm. it was also just the great satisfaction that I'd really done my personal work, that I was no longer attached to anything that she would do or not do, or prove or not prove or whatever. Mm. And in that detachment, we were really able to capture some amazing moments of connection. Like what the one that I, you know, describe in there and also actually in my, in my TEDx talk, um, which I did on how forgiving my mother radically changed my life. Yes. Um, she had already passed away when I did that, um, that talk, but there was a Easter weekend my dad was in the hospital for his 
and surgery. And I had some errands to run and my mom liked to ride in the car. So we, you know, we went in the car and she liked to sew, she would sew up her, her stockings that had holes. And then she would sew up just any piece of fabric. And I thought, well, maybe we could do better than that. So I went into a, you know, kind of store that sells embroidery things and other oh, knickknacks. And it was Easter weekend. And so I, I look, you know, we went to the children's section because she was, you know, already pretty declined by then. And I let her pick, right? I said, which one would you like? And she picked, a, it was an Easter chicken. And so we embroidered this, you know, I showed her how to do it. And she did the lines and I did the turns and she would do the line and I would do the turn. And so we did this Easter chicken. I still have it. Like, I don't have it right here, but I still have it. Um, and when we when we went to see my dad with it the next day, he he was moved to tears. Like, there were things that I was able to do with her because I was in such a detached place of not wanting, needing anything from her that were nothing short of a small miracle. Wow, that's a beautiful story. That's um, so beautiful. How did you get to that place from a place of now having spoken about this previously on our previous um, interview, you had mentioned the challenges you had in your relationship with her prior and how those had really impacted you in your adult life. And so how did you get to that place of forgiveness with her in these declining years? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm afraid that I don't have like a quick fix for forgiveness, like the, a lot of people struggle with that. And it, it's really, you have to find a place in you that you're willing to let go. Like it's, it, forgiveness lives inside a place of acceptance that what happened happened. Also understanding that the grudges you hold only hurt you. <laughs> they don't, you know, people hold a grudge as though it's going to punish the other person. Yeah. That's not how that works. But if you ask me how I did it is I had the, I don't know what it was, if it was enough despair, enough belief in the future, enough intuition, what it was that put, that took me to push the first therapy office I went into when I was 19 or 20. Um, and to just keep going, keep going, like totaling. And like I said, a, about 15 years of therapy total between you know, the ages of 20 and whatever, 50 or something mm. or 48 or 52, whatever. I mean, it was not continuous, but um, a total of 15 years just because I was determined to find, find the light. Right. Um, it, other people might be on antidepressants their whole life because they would go see the doctor. Some might commit suicide. I don't know. I had something in me made me want to search, search, search. Mm -hmm. And so I searched, search, search. And then it was eventually a byproduct of all that. Right. Mm -hmm. Now there's, you know, there's researchers who have studied, um, you know, forgiveness. And so there's a guy by the name of Fred Luskin, who maybe he's still there, maybe not, but who was at Stanford university. And he has like a nine step process for, forgiveness. So, you know, if somebody's pressing me for a method, I might send them there. Um, if you want, I can, you know, send it to you if. Um... Oh, thank you. In fact, we can put that in the link um, in, in the show notes. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll get, I'm familiar yeah, with his process, but yeah, right. please do. And we'll, especially since we've Forget mentioned me. it here on the show, we'll put it in um, the show notes for our listeners. And, but, you know, I do actually think my, it's, a, it's actually, I actually um, put it into my first book into this one. And there's a section on, on uh, forgiveness in here and it's in there, but you can find it probably on the internet. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, but I think the, the point still remains, Sonia, that by allowing yourself that journey of forgiveness, you were able to find those precious and beautiful moments that have so much value and that really only existed because of the situation you were in, because of her decline, because of your, your patience in that moment, your willingness to let go. And I think one of the things you touched on was that acceptance of what was. Yeah. That's like such a, um... It's funny because um, I just had a chat um, yesterday with my daughter. It's her birthday. She's 26. And 
I don't know, she was going through something and she was asking me and I gave her some, you know, what I thought about it. And uh, part of my, my response was, well, sometimes it was about her getting sick and she was asking for my advice anyway. So I'm like, well, sometimes you know, you're sick, you're sick. Like I had yeah. COVID a couple of weeks ago and I was like, I do so much for my, you know, to cultivate my good health. And I was probably diminished because I had some family members and close people who died in 2022, my almost 22 year old cat who died in 2022 and things like that. And so probably I was more vulnerable. You know, I was in a room, 25 people, one had COVID, three of them got it. I shouldn't have been one of those, but I was, I was probably a bit diminished or tired or whatever. And then mm. when, you're, when you're sick, you're sick, right? Yes. That's, there's no sense in, oh, I shouldn't be sick. You know, <laughs> what does that do? Probably makes you sicker yeah but but that's also like i don't have either a two-step method to to acceptance right it's a, it's a switch you have to find in yourself it's like uh, release into what's already there i'm sick already like what's the sense in rebelling so i'm not saying if you're not sick yet to not do things so that you're you know sleep well hydrate you know exercise eat good you know quality foods whatever whatever Hey guys, I'm interrupting your podcast episode to let you know about an incredible new program that I am launching in January of 2023. It is specifically for practitioners in medicine and dentistry to help you rediscover happiness and inner fulfillment within your profession and your life. I remember what it was like for me when years ago I was so depressed and anxious and feeling like I had created and built a treadmill I just couldn't get off of, pushing through every day and wishing my life away. This program is the how of how to find happiness in your practice and in your life because we know that when we feel good, that's when we can do good. Check out thebizofhappiness.com forward slash radical happiness or click the link in the show notes. I cannot wait to see you there. Yes, but it is. There's so much power in that acceptance. And interesting, even your acceptance of your mother and of your relationship in the past is what led to your forgiveness. But even in that moment in the hobby shop with your mom, the acceptance of her current situation, of her having diminished and declined from her mental faculties and that acceptance, like what can we do with what we have here instead of fighting it? I mean, another beautiful example of how acceptance allows you to live in the moment. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I have countless um, stories with her and, and, you know, and with my parents, like what, um, you know, it's amazing that in that whole, that whole year, like when I was doing, or the full, or the first six months of 2018, when I kept going, like, I didn't get sick, you know, oh, <laughs> I was, I was valiant. <laughs> it may be later, you know, or, mm -hmm. or whatnot. But so, yeah, uh, this is what I got to do. And I, I really do think that when you resist against, mm -hmm. it's subtle, right? It's, it's like the serenity prayer. And sometimes there's, you know, grant me the the power to something about recognizing what you can change and what you can't. I can never get the words all quite right. But the point is, but sometimes it, there's two ways that that can go wrong, right? One is you don't accept that you can't change something. And the other is you accept, you accept that you can't change something when actually you could do something about it. So there's two ways that... Yes. Um, and so, it, you know, it's a little bit subtle, but the things that are already there are like, you know, my parents are declining. Like there's no sense in, you know, they're too young. For, you know, my parents both passed away. My mom was 77. My dad was 78. Um, you know, that's young nowadays. Um, and so I could have, you know, spent a lot of time denying the situation, not really being you know, listening to what was coming from there. It's like, nah, 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 it's not, you know, it's probably nothing or, you know, I could have, um, mm, that's mm. not what I did. <laughs> mm. um, and so, yeah, I think, yeah, there's a lot that you can do, um, you know, to prepare 
to, to, to prepare for those moments, but you don't prepare for those moments when, when the flurry hits you. Right. Yeah. Um, so this is what I'm trying to reach people who, um, you know, are just before that <laughs> stage ah. of fear, um, that, you know, that I really want to help them get, get ready in a way, but get ready. It's not like, you know, you get, you got your shopping list and you get ready, like you're going on vacation or something, but um, get ready, like take stock of the relationship with those people you love who are, you know, likely to decline. There's of course always the uncertainty that, you know, anyone can get hit by a bus when they get out of a store or something, but there's, you know, you got aging parents, you figure, I'm sure also uh, men and women with aging spouses would be very, it would be important to talk to you as well, because I think that that fear prevents us from quote unquote, getting ready as well. You know, the denial of a spouse who's aging and, and resisting recognizing those things that are beginning to give us hints that we might be expecting a change you the serenity prayer once again comes in when and once again what that was is give me the serenity to accept the things i cannot change but the second part the courage to change the things i can and then of course the wisdom to know the difference and it's that courage to be able to make changes before the event happens that you're talking about that is what i'm talking about yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is what I'm talking about. And, uh, you know, it is a personal development journey. And so I think personal development has, you know, is now like the self-help sections of bookstores are like bigger than is probably the biggest section in many bookstores yeah. now. But there's there's a bit of pushback also with that as though, you know, self-help would solve everything. And so I don't know. I think there's some ambivalence Um sometimes in a lot of minds about, um, you know, what's possible and what's not. Um, you know, I've always felt, Sonia, that it's so interesting that death is inevitable for mm -hmm. every single one of us. It's probably the only thing we all share in common. We will all die. And yet we struggle so much with this grief and loss. It's almost like we can't seem to perfect this very inevitable thing in all of our lives. What do you think it is that interrupts us from being able to accept death and loss? Um, well, first of all, I think, uh, you know, just off the cuff here, I think that um, when you put it that way, death and loss, I think those are also different animals, but the, our own mortality or the mortality of our, Mortality, I mean, death is really, you know, the polar opposite <laughs> of life and we're living our life. I, I, I like to say sometimes to my kids, like uh, life is, um, the, the goal in life is to uh, strike the balance between living as though we're immortal and living as though we're going to die tomorrow, right? Ooh. It's like to keep your priorities, but if you're going to die tomorrow, you still need to do kind of, if you're not going to die tomorrow, really, um, you still need to do your dishes and your laundry kind of thing and the stuff that you don't want to do. <laughs> so it's like, how do you, you know, not stay away from your or not s stray too far from your priorities all the while uh, living in a way that's sustainable for you <laughs> to keep living if you happen to, right? <laughs> yes. Um, so um, that's about our own mortality. Like, well, we're, if we're, fully engaged in life, it's hard to, it's just hard to wrap our brain around it stopping. Yeah. Um, and so if our life involves other people, it's hard to wrap our brain around those people not being there anymore. Um, now the loss is, you know, after they've, um, after people have gone. And I think, I don't necessarily believe there's a way to perfect <laughs> um loss you know it, it but about losing somebody you love who's a big part of your life it's gonna hurt um mm -hmm. you know it's gonna hurt so how do you prepare your clients um 
So, I, I mean, my, my, what I want to prepare my clients for is to, you know, seize the, the most opportunity that they can seize from the relationship with their loved ones while they have time. Uh, my clients who are in grief, um, it's mostly about learning to be with the grief and letting it. I really don't believe. I mean, any any emotion. My personal view. <laughs> I find a lot of people who disagree with me on this, but my personal view is that the the quicker way through an emotion is through it. Yeah, uh, you can't bypass it. You have to experience it. You can't mm -hmm. bypass it, and you, mm -hmm. can, you know, if you resist, you just uh, you risk, um, you know. <laughs> getting sick also because that's st stress is going to reduce your immunity and whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to, or, you know, sometimes you, there's um, somatic stuff, you know, you're going to have something show up in your body. That's really a bottled up emotional issue. So I'm big into feeling, um, feeling what's there. And even if it's hard to feel, even if it feels especially if it's hard to feel, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> especially if it's hard, or I mean, uh, it's it. That's what I need to convince people of. I, I especially have to p convince people that there's actually value in just feeling what's what's there, if, even when it's difficult. Yeah, yeah. So, what is the one thing that you hope that people get out of this book? What is the one message you hope to um, have people receive? Yeah. So, um, I really hope that this book gives people hope that they can, because a lot of people have broken or damaged relationships, right? And they don't uh, necessarily understand A, what they're missing out on before it's too late, or B, how it might complicate actually the grieving process mm -hmm. and all the regret that it might, um, you know, generate after the fact. Like when you know, it's one thing to be, you know, you're distant from your dad, you're distant from your dad, but there's always a sense that there might be tomorrow, right? Yeah. But you're distanced from your dad and then your dad's dead. And then now you're alone with your unresolved business. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, people have their, their own uh, decision power. So some people, you know, are not interested in, in uh, working on that. And so that's fine. But my, my personal take is that it's really worth it, that it will, it will bring more, you know, more life and joy and extraordinary moments of connection into the years that are left. And it will ease the grieving because the grieving that I went through and, you know, grief is very different for everyone. So I don't want to say, you know, that what I went through, but being with, with all that peace and acceptance it was really, there was relief. And then there was grief from the absence. Like I'd been so involved with them and so present. And suddenly, you know, also my dad was, he was a very important person in my life. And so, you know, he was no longer going to answer the phone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I called him. Right. And so there was the loss, but there was nothing, there was nothing unresolved. You see, there was nothing left hanging and so there was a lot of sadness, a lot of sadness, you know, low energy, like grief, right? But but I would say, I don't know if that makes sense to you or to your listeners, but I would say somewhat peaceful grief. Yes, you, yes, like, I can completely see what you're saying. Uncomplicated by all those relationship challenges that mm -hmm. you didn't leave unresolved until grieving. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because I think very similar to emotional pain and feelings that we're afraid to feel and the importance of feeling those feelings, sometimes uh, the courage to have those conversations and the communication with uh, significant others or family members, or even to have them with yourself. The fear is that it's going to be too painful to face, mm -hmm. but how important it is to face and feel those things in order to resolve those challenges prior to the grieving process. 
Right, right. And also, mm -hmm. you know, how painful is it going to be if you don't? <laughs> right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so grateful to you, Sonia. Thank you for writing another beautiful, beautiful book. Mm -hmm. And thank you. This, I think this is one of those most important topics that we all should be paying attention to because all of us have loved ones who will pass and mm -hmm. recognizing and preparing ourselves and also understanding our own wounds and be, having the courage to face those uh, with forgiveness and acceptance is such a big gift. So thank you for writing this beautiful book. You're welcome. Um, and uh, we'll leave a link in the show notes for people to be able to find it. But I'd love to ask you as well, can you share with us a little bit about the courses and offers that you have currently for anybody who's interested in kind of finding out more about you and what services you offer? Of course. Um, so one side of what I do is just straight up therapy, if you want, but for people who find that they have kind of usually old and repetitive wounds and difficulties. And I do individual and couples therapy and I work in person here in France, but also um, online over Zoom. And then the other side of what I do is I have um, a whole personal development funnel. So from the start, I have a, um, uh, a freebie, which is the five things in the way of your true happiness for people who have tried everything. So it's five very simple principles. So if you look at it very, you know, very quickly, you might find it superficial, but really it's not like there's five steps. Yeah. Um, and then um, from, if you want to do more, like I have a, um, a self-study short program called, um, oh my God, I forget the name now, but it's more about the five things and what to do about them <laughs> or yes. it's more about the five things. Um, I also have a uh, small group program that I call get your future off to a great start. That's over zoom, like max eight people. And we go over a process that I've developed in four weeks to really, um, come up with your priorities for the year and, um, get your future off to a great start. But my favorite one is my one year program. It's called the Experience Your True Happiness Haven. And so that's a one year deep dive program in really all the aspects of your life. I don't go so much into work or money, but really all the other aspects of life. And I'm, I'm just finishing um, this program in French with a client and I'm just um, in awe of the, the uh -huh. changes that he's had. So I'm I'm, I'm really in love with this program. So fabulous. Um, oh I my gosh. All those links are there. I got, you know, my website, I, um, I can give you my website, which has, you know, all these things can be found. Absolutely. We have them on in the show notes. And now all of you understand why I love Sonia so much, <laughs> because she's doing such incredible work in the world. And this is exactly what we need more of. Sonia, thank you so much for joining us today. Before we leave, I know I asked you this last time, but I'm going to ask you again today because our definition is always evolving. And so what is your current definition of happiness? Um, I'm going to answer you, but would you let me tell one more story about my mother before? Ooh, I do that? yes, please. So it's about both my parents and it's about possibility, actually. And maybe that happiness got something to do um, with that. So when my parents joined um, the retirement home near me, I would have them over for tea, but my mom had had some near misses and like, um, um, what's it called? Uh, when you swallow the wrong way, right? When the food oh, like goes, aspirating, yeah, aspirating. And so I would have her over just for tea. I figured nothing much could happen for tea and she hadn't been speaking. So this is like early December, 2018. And she hadn't been speaking hardly at all for a couple of weeks. And so my dad's pretty depressed about this and they're at my house and my mom kind of perked up at my house. I think she forgot that you know, she, it reminded her of when, when she was there before, right. She forgot the, the retirement home. And so I'm asking her like, do you want tea? Do you want milk, sugar, whatever? And my dad shushes me and he's like, she's not going to answer you anyway. I'm like, dad, it doesn't matter if she answers me. Like, I'm just, you know, talking to her. I don't know if she's going to answer. Right. Yeah. And so she answered me not once, Tara, not twice, not three times, four times. There were small things. There was a yes, there was a no, there was a more, and there was a maybe or something, you know, four short answers. But my dad just sat there with tears in his eyes. Like he mm -hmm. had not considered it possible. 
that she would speak. And so do you see how, if you think it's not possible, how you might induce the impossibility, the one that you cry over? And I just, I was just being myself with my mom. Do you want this? Do you want that? And then, you know, when I sat across the table from her, I could see she was looking at me and I had these glasses actually. And so I lifted my glasses because she seemed to be looking at me like she, and she smiled at me. (laughs) And so, you know, it was just um, an amazing moment of just being open to possibility to what might happen. And um, about a week later, I went to, to join my daughter who was spending a couple of years in Africa. And my mom actually passed away while I was there. Mm-hmm. And so that was the last time um, that she came to my house. Wow. So for a definition of happiness, <laughs> um, the best definition I can give of happiness so it, it's a big debate, right? Joy, happiness, is it the same? Is it different? Which one is better? Which one do you want? Yada, yada. On my book here, I say um, unleash motivation and take action to experience greater peace, meaning, and joy. So one way that I could say it is that happiness is for each of us our own mix of peace, meaning, and joy. Yeah. But really what I mean when I when I talk about happiness is, you know, being being content, but in a, in a deep embodied way with the life that you're living. Right. And so when I'm trooping around, caring for my parents, taking them here or there, I'm not happy, like giddy and joyful. Right. But the, the enormous sense of meaning in there, Mm. um, you know, compensate at, at that time for the, the joy that was, you know, not that that was not the place for, um, you know, for, um, boisterous joy yeah. um so yeah that's yeah. what i can say that's about beautiful. My happiness beautiful thank you so much my friend and thank you for all that you do in the world i appreciate you oh i appreciate you too you do a great job of bringing everybody's message to the world so thank, thank you, you for that. And thank you to all of you for joining us here today and for opening up your mind to acceptance and possibility in grief. Bye-bye.